He grew up in a trailer park in Florida where his father had parked an old bus. But their modest means didn't keep his parents from teaching their children to help those even less fortunate than they. And his circumstances didn't get in the way of his dream to become a doctor. At Duke, Paul Farmer studied medical anthropology, merging medicine with his mission to help those in need. For Harvard Medical School, he took a one-year detour to Haiti. There, he saw friends die simply for lack of resources and adequate medical care. That spurred Farmer to help create Partners in Health. From Peru to prisons in Russia to West Africa, the organization tends the sick, builds teaching hospitals, and reforms entire healthcare systems. Today, Partners in Health makes over 800,000 home visits a year. It provides checkups to a million women around the world. But Paul Farmer says there's a long way to go. The goal? Making sure that whether we live or die doesn't turn on how much we have. On today's Bloomberg Big Decisions, Dr. Paul Farmer. Dr. Paul Farmer, welcome to Bloomberg Big Decisions. Thank you, good to be here. Uh, you have a career that is dedicated to charity and to medical science. As you look back on your life, which came first for you? Well, I mean, probably charity. Um, I had, I don't know why I thought when I was a kid, I really want to be a doctor. I, we didn't have any doctors in the family. I had never been to a doctor, uh, but I had this idea, probably from television, your fault. The charity part was something I learned from my parents who um, had very limited means in a large family, but w were involved in, in charity. My father particularly was interested in uh, what in that day was, uh, was called retarded uh, people or retarded citizens, um, and he dragged all of his kids into the, the work. He was also interested in elderly people, the el frail elderly people. We lived in uh, Florida. Uh, for some time in a campground, and so we knew a lot of snowbirds, as they were called. In any case, my, my parents really instilled that in us pretty early on. And so you, at an early age, were exposed to the situation where you have modest means, and still there was charity. Yep, absolutely, and I've seen that all over the world. I saw that in Haiti when I went there in 1983 as a uh, young person before medical school. I, I lived in a, a community of squatters. They had been displaced by a large hydroelectric dam, and I got to see how they interacted with each other and how they looked out for each other, especially the, the frailest. We lived in a bus, eight of us. The um, Bluebird, right? The Bluebird bus, you remember. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and it was, we were the only people we knew who lived in a bus or, you know, kids. Um, and, uh, and my parents just expected us to be mindful of other people who had less than we did. And there are people who didn't have intact families, who didn't have, we had plenty to eat, you know, we had enough to, one of my brothers is 6'6", six, six, you know. Uh, we weren't short of food, but we were short of pretty much everything else and still were encouraged to think about others. And I'm very grateful to them for, for that lesson. What took you to Duke? Uh, a scholarship, but uh, you know, again, it, it, it look, looking back, it just seems like happenstance. Um, I had a uh, high school guidance counselor um, who said, you know, if you want to be a doctor, you should think about universities where there's a strong focus on medicine. And she mentioned only two, and I don't know that I'd heard of either of them. She mentioned Duke and Johns Hopkins. And, uh, you know, I looked at a map. She may have mentioned Yale. Um, none of that meant much, much to us, but looking at a map, I saw, well, Duke is in North Carolina, and I, we're in Florida, so that's closer. <laughs> And it was, you know, and in the end, I only managed to fill out the one application. You came from modest means uh, as you grew up. Uh, public school, you go to Duke. Were you prepared? Looking no, back at it? no, I was not prepared, and it was so difficult. I couldn't believe it that there would be like a calculus class where I would, you know, barely get by, and I had to study for the first time, really study. So no, I was not prepared. In fact, I remember when uh, I first heard someone say that first year to another, one student say to another, where did you prep? I'm like, what the hell does that mean? And uh, so it was, it was a cultural shock. Um, probably the biggest one uh, of my life, which is saying a lot when then you go to Haiti and Rwanda and other places like that. It was, I was very poorly prepared. What did you study? Did you go right into science? I went into chemistry, um, which I had, and I loved, especially biochemistry. 
And then I took a class called medical anthropology. Why? Because it had the M word in it. I took medical ethics, and I took medical anything with medicine in it. I did my first serious research project outside of science. Um, I went to an emergency room, the Duke emergency room. They call it participant observation in anthropology. And um, I wrote a paper about how race and class and insurance status altered use of an emergency room. So that's medical anthropology. You can study whatever you want. And the idea is that you're using this broader perspective to understand why people do the things they do, why they say what they say. And there's a political aspect to it, too. I mean, as I understand it, you found an intellectual long dead named Rudolf Virchow, Yeah. right? One of the things he said, reportedly, was that politics is nothing but medicine on a large scale. Yeah. Explain that connection between politics and medicine. This is a 19th century uh, German figure who some consider the father of medical anthropology. He had been a total reactionary as a young and privileged man and uh, went into medicine. And then he was sent to Silesia to study a famine or, and a typhus outbreak, if memory serves. And that converted him, that experience of being around people living in dire poverty and facing both poverty and disease, that, that changed him. And uh, he became the scholar uh, and physician that, uh, to this day, he's admired. You also became reacquainted at Duke, as I understand it, uh, with Haitians, yeah. uh, through a nun, yeah. in fact. Tell us about that experience. I wanted to do a big story for a Duke publication about the mistreatment of my farm workers in the stream, by the growers particularly, and their, and their bosses. And uh, there was no United Farm Worker chapter. There was a Friends of the United Farm Worker chapter, and it was one of the people involved was a nun named Sister Juliana DeWolf. And I interviewed her for my story. She was a tough character for sure. And then I got to, you know, got to know them and what they were doing around activism and how they were helping migrant farm workers. And it was so pragmatic, you know, the ministry of showing up. They would help with grocery shopping. They would help move people from one place to another. Maybe they had a court, a court appointment or something. And I just was so moved by the practicality of those nuns, and there were several of them, and what they were willing to do to help other people. And that changed my life, actually. And, and was she involved in liberation theology? She was, uh, although, again, that, I was just starting to read. I had grown up Catholic, and uh, my parents weren't interested in, really in Catholicism. It was just more of a social obligation for my grandmothers. It didn't mean anything to me until, as a young adult, I got to meet people like her who were living out the gospel and uh, as they saw it. And uh, I, I was impressed then and I still am now. How did this group Partners in Health explain how that came to be? We were doing a health survey of these villages and there were six young Haitians who worked on this survey. And by the time I graduated from medical school, three of them were dead. You came out of Duke, and in a sense you went two directions at the same time. You went to Haiti, and you went to Harvard Medical School. Yeah. How, how, did, how did you first go to Haiti? I wanted to go to West Africa and be a doctor. And to that end, I said, I'm going to get a Fulbright grant. And uh, I applied for a Fulbright, and I didn't even get an interview. And so plan B was Haiti, and I had won a prize for some paper I wrote at, at Duke, and uh, you know, with a financial, uh, it was a thousand bucks. It seemed like a lot of money to me. And I went to Haiti for a year. You know, I'd just never been able to leave. So I applied to Harvard Medical School from Haiti. I got my acceptance letter there in Haiti. And uh, since then, 1983, 84, 83, I guess, I've been shuttling between Harvard and Haiti. You went to Harvard Medical School and also got a PhD there. At the same time, you're going back half the year or more to Haiti. That was a good smokescreen. <laughs> the MD, PhD. So you did a medical degree and a doctoral, another doctoral degree. Mine was in medical anthropology, as you know. And if you're missing from the med school, people would say, well, he must be doing his PhD. And that was highly approved at Harvard, you know, to do a PhD. And on the anthropology side, 
when I was missing, they would say, oh, he must be doing his rotations at the hospitals, whereas I was really often in Haiti during those years. And by the time they figured it out, it was too late. I had my degrees. <laughs> and out of this group, Partners in Health, uh, explain how that came to be. Well, the crying need, as you, as you mentioned, um, you know, how could you see something like that? Some of the things that I saw, I mean, just to give you an example of how tough this was in those years, we were doing a health survey of these villages, and there were six, uh, six young Haitians who, our age, when I say young Haitians, my age, who worked on this survey. And by the time I graduated from medical school, three of them were dead. One died of an infection after childbirth. And the other two were good friends of mine, too. One died of cerebral malaria. She had an unusual uh, but well-described complication. She went psychotic. She had psychotic symptoms. And so she went to a psychiatrist, and she died in the waiting room of cerebral malaria. And the third guy, um, again, this really vigorous young man, got typhoid. and. Um, and he had gone off, his parents, his family had taken him to a, a voodoo practitioner, whatever you want to say. And I found him and convinced him that we should take him to the hospital. I remember rolling him or being o leaning over him as he's being reeled, wheeled into the operating room. And he said, I'm scared, I'm, I'm going to die. I said, don't, you know, don't be silly, you know, you'll be fine. And the next day he was dead. Mm. Those three examples have stuck with me, and they led us in many ways to, to start Partners in Health. Um, and, you know, the idea being that people shouldn't die of a readily treatable disease because they're poor. And over the decades, as we grew, we were able to address more and more problems. Um, uh, I mentioned uh, West Africa, I finally got there. But before that came Peru and Rwanda and Russian prisons in Siberia. And it's been very, very satisfying work. You mentioned you went from Haiti to Peru to Russia to West Africa. What was that process? Was it just you saw a need and you went for it, or was there a larger plan? Well, we didn't have a larger plan. I got to say, between 1983 and 2000, and let's say 2003, um, all those years. It was just happenstance. So how did we get to Peru? Well, a friend of ours had nourished this lifelong dream of working in Peru, um, or long-term dream. And he went there to a, a squatter settlement again uh, in the outskirts of Lima. And he got sick, and it turns out he had tuberculosis. And finally, we convinced him to come back to, to Boston. And uh, his his strain, the infecting strain of tuberculosis proved to be multi-drug resistant tuberculosis, and he died of it. And let me tell you, that does not happen often in Massachusetts, that someone dies of tuberculosis. And that was a big wake-up call to pay more attention to the epidemic in Peru, which led us to Russia. We'd gone, we're looking for money for our work in Peru, and went to Soros, George Soros, and he said, I'm not going to help you in Peru. Why don't you help us in Russia? When we went there in the 90s, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the collapse of the ruble, it was just a mess. Um, with the rise of this kind of poverty and inequality, there was a rise in petty criminality, thievery, kiting checks, all kinds of things. So the prisons got filled up, and what happens when prisons fill up? Uh, there tend to be big tuberculosis outbreaks, same in the United States. And uh, at the point when we started working there, 26% of all of the prisoners with tuberculosis, diagnosed with tuberculosis, were dying. They didn't have the right drugs right then. Their labs were falling apart. We worked with our Russian colleagues, um, and within one year, the mortality went down to zero, more or less, and stayed there for 15 years. Let's talk about the money. You had several people put together Partners in Health, but one of them was a significant funder. Yeah, for a Tom. a long time, Tom White. With time, that went away. Yeah. Uh, what is the process by which you renew your funding, expand your funding? What is that process? I have to think of a word for some ex extraordinarily painful chronic <laughs> condition. Um, you know, it's just uh, the process is every year, and this is tiresome after all these years, but the process is every year we go looking for funds to maintain the work. And you'll see a lot of uh, donors who want to do something new or look for some magic bullet. And sometimes we avail ourselves of those 
opportunities as well. But the big challenge is really keeping medical systems going. And that requires a steady input. Every day, and every, or every week anyway, we have to think how we're going to find money to make it run. You get grants from some very big philanthropies. You mentioned George Soros, yeah. um, uh, the Gates Foundation. Do they ask for evidence uh, that would indicate why their money is being well spent? I, I think, uh, well, especially the Gates Foundation, I think they do ask those questions. Uh, and uh, they're tough-minded about it. Uh, so in order to appeal to those funders, you really do have to, you know, do all your homework and, you know, present it properly and then provide ample follow-up. Um, but that doesn't really address the need for the ongoing operations funds. That's the real nightmare. Do you have a dream or a goal of how big Partners in Health could become or should become? Yeah, I mean, a lot bigger. In none of the places where we work are we doing enough, even Haiti. Um, and uh, there are plenty of places where we'd like to work, uh, but don't because we know we'll get caught in this trap, you know, holding the bag. You know, you build a hospital, start putting, you know, you get, think about the staff and the stuff and the space and the systems that would make it work right, and you're going to still be holding the bag um, after the initial enthusiasm of donors wears off. What can you tell us about the U.S. healthcare system? The primary weakness is that we don't attend enough to preventing adverse outcomes among those who are already sick. Give us a diagnosis of global health right now. If you look at the globe, yeah. Where do we have the most pressing needs? Where are we underinvested? So if I were to give a global report card on global health, I'd say, well, we've made a lot of progress, but we started with such low aspirations, colonial medicine, international health, that we really, really have to redouble our efforts. And one of the reasons I am grateful to these large foundations, like the Gates Foundation, is that they changed the discussion just by making resources available or um, or becoming the major players. And then came a couple of other welcome developments. Um, one of them was, you know, I didn't see this coming, but I was happy to be involved in, in you know, in, in part of it. President George W. Bush, he changed the formula again by investing U.S. taxpayer dollars in AIDS treatment. And so that step and, and another one, the creation of the Global Fund to fight AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria, they may have been narrowly focused on two or three illnesses, uh, but they changed the, the discussion very substantially. Take the two examples you give, the Gates Foundation, private on the one hand, uh, George W. Bush and what happened with Africa and AIDS on the other. What does it tell you about the balance, the intersection between private and public in dealing with global health equity? It tells me that we're insane not to integrate public and private. We didn't come to this quickly. It took us a decade to say, of working in Haiti, say, to look around and say, well, the hospital that we've built, which is a private NGO hospital, is you know, answering a great need. But look at all these public clinics and hospitals around that are really shuttered, that are not working. And so we decided, again, as a collective, that we would uh, direct all of our attention to public facilities, hospitals, clinics, whatever. Now, in Rwanda, the, the yield on that was just enormous, right? Uh, just to give one example, the hospital in the northern part of Rwanda. Yeah. So that's a beautiful hospital. Partners in Health bit, built it. Um, it cost $4.3 million, which is not a lot for a 150-bed hospital. Um, that would, wouldn't even get you a Starbucks building in New York. Um, and within one year of building it, the Rwandan government was paying 70% of all the salaries. And so that allows you to go deep and to build up, to take those private resources that are private capital can move more quickly than public capital. Some of the places, some of the governments, that need the help the most are not the most attractive governments. How do you strike that balance? Do you only go to governments where you say we really can live with their human rights no. record? Or do you have to be selective? Well, you have to be selective, but 
we don't just go to governments where there is an enlightened leadership. We focus usually on the burden of disease, like where is, where is the problem greatest? If you looked at a, a, a wealthy country, industrialized country like Russia, and looked at those numbers on tuberculosis outcomes, those are as bad as the poorest place. And we found there in Russia in the 90s really wonderful leaders inside the prison system. I mean, with Rwanda, we knew what we were getting into. We knew that we would have a government focused on health disparities. They told us that from the beginning, and they have been. That's not the case in some places. You know, Haiti's gone through how many coups in the times we've been there, how many ministers of health, a lot. But we've also always found enlightened government officials somewhere in the bureaucracy. So from what you've learned around the world, Haiti, Peru, Russia, West Africa, what can you tell us about the U.S. healthcare system? Well, I think most Americans know that we spend a really big fraction of our GDP on healthcare. It's over 18%, I think. And there, there's no doubt that we're not getting value for that kind of investment. Um, and there are lots of reasons for that. Um, there's a very weak health system here, the system itself. When someone needs a heart transplant or any major surgical procedure, we, we've got that covered. We, we, on biotech development, new therapeutics, the Americans are, are we're way, a, way ahead in many ways. The system itself is weak, however. And one of the primary weaknesses, uh, in fact, I would go so far as to say the primary weakness, is that we don't attend enough to preventing adverse outcomes among those who are already sick. So what do we need? Well, we learned in Haiti and then Rwanda that if you have community health workers who actually help people in their homes or places of work, that you're gonna get improved clinical outcomes. One of the reasons that in the United States we work with the Navajo Nation um, is because we don't have to argue about that with them. They have had community health workers for decades, 60, 70 years. So we knew we wouldn't have to go through the same arguments, and it was about financing these petty, small salaries. These are underpaid people, and there should be literally millions of them in the United States helping move care from hospitals and even clinics home. We're starting to hear that here in the United States as well. Really? Yeah. I mean, some of the major funders uh, you know, I mentioned the Gates Foundation or the Gateses, Warren Buffett, other people who have paid attention to this are, are saying, hey, how, how, how should we do this in the United States? So as you look at global health equity, uh, what gives you hope and what makes you angry? Uh, well, I, I tend to need to be hopeful. Every time that we turned our attention to an intractable problem, uh, it is proven quite tractable, right? It needs resources. The angry side is, is really related to the same problem. If these interventions work, then why is it so damn hard to find the resources to address the problems? And yeah, that makes me, that makes me angry still. You know, I think back to those young people in Haiti, my friends who died untimely, I'm sad about it more than angry now, but it's still an outrageous thing to see some young people die of malaria, typhoid, and in childbirth. And that, that there's cause for indignation anyway. Dr. Paul Farmer, thank you so very much. Great to have you here. Great to be back. <laughs>